19th semester. Uh, I'll do a couple updates. For those of you taking the class, of course, this is the last uh, session, which you have to document, and the research note, the second research note, is due next Thursday uh, by the end of class time. And you should have an email with the course instructor survey uh, if you choose to fill that out. So you should have an email to fill out the course instructor survey. To introduce our speaker, our final speaker for the semester, I'll let Josh Rhodes do that. All right, so for the last um, energy symposium speaker, we have Richard Meyer from the American Gas Association. So Richard serves as the managing director of the energy group of the American Gas Association, which represents more than 200 local energy companies that deliver natural gas throughout the U.S. Mr. Meyer's responsibilities include policy and economic analysis to support the uh, association's outreach and advance awareness of the important role the natural gas utilities play in meeting the needs of the clean energy economy. And, Richard Meyer, and Mr. Meyer's work relates uh, to natural gas supply and demand fundamentals, residential and large volume markets, greenhouse gas emissions, climate-related policy, natural gas distributed generation, like combined heat and power. Before AGA, Richard was with ICF, with its Fuels and Technology Group. He has an MA in Global and Environmental Politics from American University and an MS in Physics from California Polytech. And we are excited to have him here for our speakers today. So, thank you. Can, we, can you all hear me? I'll project. Uh, it's good. Oh, yeah, now oh, that made a whole big difference. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you, Josh, for the invitation to speak here. <laughs> Let's see if that works. Uh, Josh went real quickly through my bio. I'm with the American Gas Association. We are a trade association in Washington, D.C. That's a business association. Basically, what we do is we represent a membership. And that membership is comprised of um, businesses, in particular, natural gas utilities. So these are the investor-owned gas companies that serve natural gas to homes and businesses in all 50 states. So, um, so we are concerned with the residential, uh, commercial, and industrial sectors that use natural gas in the United States, as well as a little bit of power generation and, um, and natural gas for vehicles. So in other words, a lot of time when we're talking about the natural gas market or thinking about natural gas issues, the topics are related to how we're using in the electric power sector or how we're going to be using natural gas to export uh, via LNG or pipeline to Mexico. We are, you know, our companies are the the companies that uh, we represent, rather, the companies that pipe natural gas up and down the street to your home so you can cook your eggs on Saturday morning. So just to give you a, orient you where we exist within the kind of broader energy space. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a topic that uh, has been uh, key for us and our members, and it's around this idea of residential electrification. Now, I call this energy opportunity and a thoughtful pathway to emissions reductions. And I'm going to go through the motivation for uh, a series of modeling efforts um, and a study that we released last year to understand this idea of policy-driven residential electrification. Let me define that real quick, and then we'll come back to that. When I mean policy-driven residential electrification, what I'm talking about are policies, or regulations that would uh, incentivize or otherwise uh, uh, compel um, households to switch their existing space and water heating, which are fueled by primarily natural gas, but also fuel oil and propane, and switch those end uses to an alternative electric end use, specifically an electric heat pump or an electric heat pump water heater. That's residential electrification and specifically driven by policy. These policies, these ideas, they are bubbling up all over the place. And it's primarily in the context of uh, strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm going to talk about how we came to do this study, what we found in it, what it means, and then think through maybe based on those implications of what we found, um, the implications of what policy-driven residential electrification means to consumers, to the electric power grid, and so forth. Um, think through maybe there are what I call more thoughtful ways to addressing emissions reductions. But first, uh, a story. 
Uh, this story happened across the United States this year. On January 30th, in the height of the polar vortex, this was the you know, massive Arctic air that you know, descended down upon Canada and much of the upper Midwest. It didn't get quite as far as Texas, but um, some of the cold effects were still felt down, down this far. Uh, on that day, on the coldest day of this year, January 30th, the U.S. set a single day record in terms of natural gas consumption. A little over 150 billion cubic feet of natural gas consumed across the lower 48. If we break that down, by the way, that was a new record in, for this year, which surpassed the prior record one year before. What I'm showing you here is uh, peak day natural gas consumption, um, typically on a January day, and what that has looked like over time. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out that peak day natural gas consumption has been increasing. This is, yes, and due in part because we're exporting more natural gas now, but we're also consuming more in the U.S. for our space heating needs, uh, for use in industry, for use in power generation. And we can break that out. There's uh, two colors here. The blue represents January of 2018. That was the peak day of all time last year, and then it was surpassed by January 30th of this year when we set that 150 BCF record. Uh, so we're mostly using it in the industrial, excuse me, the residential commercial sector, I'll come back to this, as well as uh, this was a record day for natural gas consumption in the power sector uh, for a winter month. Industrial sector, that's an all-time record day as well, 29 billion cubic feet. And then uh, a little bit of LNG feed gas exports to Mexico and other demand, that's really pipeline demand to move the gas through the system. I want to focus on this. 79 billion cubic feet of natural gas. That was what was delivered through gas utility pipes to homes and businesses on that single day. In this case, it was January 1st of 2018. How much energy does 79 billion cubic feet represent? Well, let's round that up to 80 billion cubic feet. I'm going to convert that into units of energy most typically associated with electricity. So 80 billion cubic feet is roughly equivalent to 24 terawatt hours of energy which is equivalent to what 1,000 gigawatts of electric generating capacity will generate in terms of electrical energy over 24 hours. Uh, those of you that are experts in the power grid uh, probably know that the U.S. boasts a little over 1,000 gigawatts of net summer capacity. It's a little over 1,100, actually. But what this is saying is that the amount of nat the energy in the natural gas delivered just to residential and commercial uh, customers, homes and businesses, on a single day is roughly equivalent to what the entire U.S. electric grid could generate in terms of electrical energy uh, in a 24-hour period. Just putting that amount of energy into context such that when we go back to this question of, well, if we're going to address emissions, we need to switch this out and put in cleaner, perhaps electric alternatives. So thinking through what that is going to mean in terms of meeting our essential energy services and energy demand on the coldest day of the year. There are many proposals out there, and um, typically this topic of electrification comes up in the context of deep decarbonization uh, and strategies to reduce carbon emissions across our energy economy as a way to mitigate climate change. There's a number of policy studies, uh, other, um, other proposals that have come out where this concept of electrification is key to reducing emissions in the building sector. Again, the concept is simple. Uh, you increase energy efficiency as much as you can. You switch out your existing fossil fuel end uses and replace it with an electric alternative. And then simultaneous to that, you green the grid. You increase the amount of renewables and other clean energy or zero carbon resources on the grid. And that's the way you drive deep decarbonization. That's the way you drive emissions down in the building sector. This was going to be policy from the federal government. One of these here, this, this one to the right, this is the United States mid-century strategy for deep decarbonization. This was the report put out by the Obama administration, by the White House, uh, in November of 2016, it, actually, it was their response, their plan uh, after um, the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, it 
did not materialize in terms of tangible policy in Washington, D.C., because um, the Democrats had lost the race of the White House a week before. And now with the Trump administration, um, where it is clearly not uh, that the Trump administration has not made climate change a policy priority, what we've seen is that the action, the, these conversations, these policy ideas have moved from a federal level down to uh, the state and local level. So we've seen electrification policies as part of a deep decarbonization discussion pop up in states like California, Washington, Oregon, Massachusetts, and elsewhere it was up in Canada and the province of Ontario considering it as part of its, this isn't the exact term, it's long-term energy plan. Uh, and, uh, but also in states, in, uh, excuse me, in localities and cities across the country where mayors uh, signing 100% clean energy agreements to, uh, you know, motivated uh, because the, they feel that the federal government is not doing enough, has not stepped up with its leadership, and therefore um, states, localities have instead filled that policy gap. Let me level set. I, uh, so I'm a part economist, part policy analyst at AGA, and uh, I spend a lot of time with data, I spend a lot of time in Excel, spend a lot of time with charts. So I love my charts and I love presentations with charts. So let me just set a few kind of data analytical baselines here before we move into the analysis that we did. When we're talking about electrifying our space and water heating, recognize that there's just about 60 million households that use natural gas for primary space heat today in the US, another almost 11 million that use fuel oil and propane. So just about 70 million households with um, these fossil end uses that would have to be replaced if, uh, if these policy proposals were to move forward. Uh, about 41 million use electricity as their primary space heat. Not all of that are using heat pumps, which are, tend to be more efficient. A lot of that is baseboard heating uh, furnaces that are less efficient. In terms of the greenhouse gas emissions impact, uh, right here we have total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. That's the big pie. Uh, and I've just broken out what residential natural gas, um, the share of total emissions from residential natural gas, as well as the share of res uh, from residential electricity consumption. Um, actually, not surprisingly, the uh, CO2 footprint from our residential electricity use is almost about three times as big as that from uh, residential natural gas. Let me put that number into context. 266 million metric tons of CO2 in 2016. So let's say 250 per year. That's roughly equivalent to two weeks of Chinese coal emissions. So it's, you know, I, I'm not saying it's not important. And it is my personal view, uh, as well as AGA's advocacy, that you know, all sectors of the economy do need to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions reductions. But it is also important to keep these facts in mind and that when we're thinking through these perhaps national policies as it relates to how we heat our homes and heat our water in our homes, that this is the emissions profile that we're talking about. It's 4% of the total. And if you could get rid of that and replace it with zero carbon energy, that's the amount of uh, emissions reduction you would get for it. One of the foundational findings uh, as we set into this process was the importance of understanding energy systems, not just on an average basis, and the amount of energy, natural gas, electricity, and so forth that we use over the course of a year, but thinking through it on a peak basis. Here, we're, I'm showing you what the peak monthly uh, energy use is in a winter month versus that of a summer month. and, and, and I mean, alluding to what I had showed you earlier in terms of the amount of natural gas on that peak winter day, it shouldn't be any surprise that we use a whole lot more energy to, to heat our homes uh, and for other end uses in a winter month than we do to cool ourselves and cool our spaces and all the our other, end, other end uses uh, during the summer. Uh, this disparity gets even more significant when you look on a peak week, peak day, peak hourly basis. And the reason the peak is so important is because that is how we build our 
energy infrastructure. We, we build it not for the average use, we, use it, we build it for our peak day consumption. Our electric grid is designed that way, so is our natural gas grid. So that's, and those infrastructure requirements therefore shape costs and the rates for gas and electricity that you pay on your utility bills. So I, I, get, I don't have a chart for this, but it's also worth recognizing that we have seen a fundamental evolution of the electric, U.S. electric grid. We are using a lot more natural gas. We are using a whole lot more renewables. Coal is retiring and being displaced on the system. As a result, the U.S. electric grid has become significantly cleaner over really the past 10, 12 years, depending on where you want to start. So as the grid decarbonizes and this, these policy, this policy push um, from state localities and in some cases the federal government, uh, these calls to electrify everything have grown. So we stepped back and we said, okay, so what actually happens if you try to electrify your residential space and water heat? Of course, remember, we are, our companies are the ones that deliver natural gas to your home, to your business, primarily for space and water heating. And so we, you know, these electrify everything conversations typically are about a whole range of possible end uses from transportation as well as your, your business, your home. We just focused on this narrow piece for this analysis on your residential space and water heating. We worked with a, a group, ICF. Um, those of you that were listening in my bio heard that I used to work for ICF. That was actually the first pro project I had done with them in the eight years I had been at AGA. Uh, they're, they're a consulting firm in, in, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. in Fairfax, Virginia, and we brought them in to help us think through the questions we needed to ask and try to answer as part of this analysis. So let me go through the five key questions we asked um, and that ICF helped us try to answer. First, will policy-driven residential electrification actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And the answer to that is it depends. It depends where you are. In some parts of the country, uh, we looked out to 2035 and in you know, based on certain assumptions uh, and t current trend lines, yes, by 2035, replacing your, say, natural gas furnace with a, an electric heat pump would actually reduce emissions. However, in other parts of the country where there's still a significant amount of coal and natural gas on the electric grid, uh, re residential electrification does not necessarily reduce emissions. And so a policy like that just wouldn't even make sense in those parts of the country. How will policy, the second question, how will policy-driven residential electrification impact natural gas utility customers? Broadly speaking, we found the impacts to be significant, with costs ranging from 36 to 45 percent increase in the amount, uh, in the energy costs associated with space and water heating per household. One of the things we did in this analysis that I think was unique at the time, we've we released this a year ago, and we've seen a lot of work since. But uh, we asked, what would the impacts of these policies be on the power sector, and in particular on your electric infrastructure requirements? Uh, and what we found is that that increase in peak day electric consumption associated with converting that existing fossil fuel to electricity to meet your space and water heating needs on those coldest days of the year, that that would drive significant infrastructure requirements and potential costs associated with the generation, transmission, and distribution systems uh, for electricity consumption. What would be the overall cost of policy-driven residential electrification? We ran a couple scenarios. I'll get into that. All-in costs from the consumer to the grid impacts, about $600 billion to $1.2 trillion. And what do you get for that? You get a 1% to 1.5% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the year 2035. When you add those costs and those emissions reductions and put one over the other, uh, we can answer the fifth question, which is how do the costs of policy-driven residential electrification compare to other approaches to reduce emissions? We found it, is a very, it tends to be a very costly approach 
especially compared to other alternatives. To put a number to that, somewhere between $600 to $800 per ton of CO2 reduce uh, is the cost associated with these policies. And that's not more significant cost compared with perhaps other uh, pathways to carbon emissions. I'm going to stop just for a sec. If you have a question, please ask. I don't mind being interrupted here. I'm not giving a super formal lecture, and I'm happy to keep this a little bit more dynamic. Um, does anyone have any questions before I proceed on? Because I am going to start diving into the weeds just a little bit. On a previous slide, you that is a great question. So, yeah, absolutely. So the question was, is this value that I showed um, this is the electrical, well, so in the summer of July 2011, this electrical energy, is this the electrical energy associated with cooling? Is that just at the site or the household or the, the building um, and, and other end uses? Or does it also account for the energy upstream required to generate and move that electricity? It's the first one. It's just that site energy number. So there's, there, is more, there is more energy required, but there would also be more energy required on the left side here. A huge difference. But a huge difference, yes. It would be, generally, this would probably be about three times as higher. Um, and but, you know, it makes sense, right? There's a lot of, we're using natural gas directly here. It's a site number where the, where the natural gas and other end uses would be upstream of that. So that's, that's correct. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, on the slide before, the one you were just on, the foundational findings. Yeah. The slide right be before it. Um, you had a graph with like emissions related to electricity versus heating, I think, or r electricity and natural gas. Was that just for heating? The, this is all, th this on one right. right here, this yeah. is all end uses. So this is the, uh, so if you take the, so for the, the orange here, this residential electricity number, if you took the entire power sector CO2 emissions and then allocated it out by sector based on the amount of electricity consumption in that sector, that's the CO2 emissions, what this represents. I have another chart for this. I probably should have put it in. But basically, you take the whole power sector and you subdivide it based on the amount of electricity consumption in the residential sector in the electricity consumption in the commercial sector and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, on that note, can you compare the relative greenhouse gas intensity of uh, of, of the natural gas versus electric used for heating? Like, I, I guess how much of that orange wedge is for uh, residential heating, which you compare in the left chart, compared to how much of the residential natural gas carbon emissions comes from heating? That's a great question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the electricity would look like. So in, if I'm interpreting this right, like what share of that wedge is associated with electrical space heating? And what share of that lighter blue wedge for natural gas, what share of that is associated with um, space heating from natural gas? On the space heating number, I believe it's something like 60%, give or take. I think another 20% for, uh, for water heating and then the other end uses above that. It might even be a little bit more than 60%. But it's, it's like 60 to 70% for the space heating. So let's say round number is 3%. Three percentage points of this pie is associated with natural gas for space heating. But there's, uh, and it's, it's not that same share for residential electricity. Obviously, we're using, we're not using as much electricity for space heat because it's, turns out it's not as efficient. And, um, and the coldest uh, areas of the country where your space heating requirements are most intense are, tend to use natural gas or fuel or oil or propane and not electricity. So it wouldn't contribute as much to that, to that slice. 
So thanks for the question. All good analysis uh, analyses have key input slides. Um, there's two keys to this. So there's the let me start with the policy case that we that we applied. So there's an electrification policy that we had to um, kind of layer onto the energy system here. And what we said is starting in 2023. But mind you, we started this analysis in 2017, so we were thinking five, six years out for this, to, this policy to begin. So starting in 2023, basically no new, well, not basically, no new natural gas um, appliances or fuel oil or propane appliances could be installed in the residential sector. And by appliances, I specifically mean the space and water heating. Um, and so that meant all new construction would go all electric, and it would be a, a, an electric heat pump for your heater, for your heat, electric water, heat, electric heat pump water heater for your water heat um, for those two end uses. With the existing uh, natural gas, fuel oil, and propane base, as those appliances reach the end of their useful life, uh, they, would be ha they would have to be replaced so, uh, with uh, an electric heat pump and electric heat pump water heater. So the retrofit market would slowly, over time, transition to electricity starting in 2023. Uh, we took this analysis only out through 2035, just trying to get our arms around some reasonable time frame here. Uh, we did look at the emissions impact. So let me stop. And say the, so the policy case ended at 2035, but we looked at the emissions impacts from those policies out through 2050. And I might add that that pace of replacement that we had um, was very consistent with a 100% electrification by 2050. So in other words, we start the policy in 2023, very aggressively apply it out through 2035, and if we had kept that trend line going, we would have had near 100% replacement so near 100% electrification of residential space and water heat by 2050. Uh, the reason we structured it that way is because it would have been quite consistent with some of those other deep decarbonization uh, policy uh, proposals that I had alluded to on, a, on an earlier slide. For the water heating, why did you change? Well, um, I know you know the answer to this because electric resistance water heating is very inefficient. And to do that, uh, it, well, one, from a policy standpoint, would, it makes no sense. Your natural gas water heater is you know, going to have a carbon emissions and an and a energy footprint about half that of an electric resistance water heater. So in order to make this policy fair um, and to achieve its ostensible goal of actually reducing energy and reducing emissions, we assumed uh, an electric heat pump water heater, which is quite a bit more efficient. It is, instead of just using resistance element to heat your water, you're moving heat uh, through, uh, through a compressor and coil, uh, and therefore you can achieve efficiencies higher than 100%. Did you look at the total household impact? We did not look at those, we did not look at those impacts, those, uh, those secondary and tertiary impacts of uh, moving heat from the house and that, that impact on your load, we didn't, we didn't quite get there. Uh, that would be an interesting analysis. Yeah, put, write that down, Josh. Uh, just in terms of our baseline assumptions, we used the annual energy outlook uh, for 2017 just as our starting point. It is a, well, to some it's a respected uh, uh, outlook, um, but basically it, it, it is a transparent one. That's what we were concerned with. And when you're doing this kind of analysis, to us, we want to keep it simple. We, we ha we, we've got some energy future and we can, you know, make that what, it, I, you know, you can assume any sort of different directions in terms of what that baseline would look like. Let's keep that part simple because we were just, we then just wanted to look at what are the impacts of electrifying space and water heat. So we didn't, as a matter of our reference case, include probably a likely increase in conversions of um, electric, or excuse me, uh, uh, increased adoption of electric vehicles. That would have an effect on this analysis, probably pretty significantly. 
We did, that's not part of this. Um, we didn't try to optimize the energy system. So if you had you know, more electric vehicles on your system and more electrified space and water heat and try to you know, build out the system to meet that and shift demand over time, that, those are all very interesting analyses. We, we, we didn't go that far because we were just trying to answer, uh, I think, a more simpler question, which is just what are, very simply put, what would the energy requirements be if you were to apply this very simple but aggressive broad-based policy? Uh, so just to be clear, I'm quite, uh, you know, there are limitations to this analysis, and there are ways you could go about this differently. This was not an optimization exercise. Uh, finally, we had two electric generation cases. So you've got your policy case, which electrifies all your space and water heat. Um, and you know, it perturbs from your reference case, from your baseline. But how do you meet all of that new electric demand? And so we had two cases. We had a renewables only case where in the future, all incremental generation that is built as a result of this policy uh, would be renewables only and, and uh, battery storage as well. We also had a market generation case because we found the costs in that scenario was actually pretty high. The market generation case allows new natural gas fired power generation to be built in response to this policy. There's some interesting implications that fall out of that, but I'll, I'll share that in a minute. So study conclusions. I've already pretty, told, pretty much told you what the conclusions are, but let's dive into some of the details. First, on the customer side, uh, let's start on the right. This is an impact on average US annual costs per converted customer. So per customer that has converted to electricity, um, their baseline costs here in blue, just about $2,000, 1990 Everything on top of that is the incremental increase, first associated with the direct consumer costs. What do I mean by that? Well, this is the cost of replacing the equipment and the cost differential between an electric heat pump and electric furnace and the installation of these two, uh, of, of those appliances. Similar with the, uh, with the uh, natural gas water heater and uh, electric heat pump water heater and the differential there. So you have the installation and appliance cost, but you also have the cost of running that equipment. So what's the difference between uh, the cost of electricity for that equipment versus the cost of, say, natural gas to run, um, run the other scenario? Those are the direct consumer costs. On top of that, that's the per converted customer share of the upstream infrastructure costs. So that's the generation and transmission costs associated with uh, the new electric infrastructure requirements. We did not look at electric distribution. That was beyond the scope of what we were trying to do in this national study. To do that kind of analysis, you would have to look on a, a, like a system by system basis, go utility by utility, service territory by service territory, and dive really deep. We couldn't do that. Those costs uh, could be very significant and would need to be included in any let's say, more thorough evaluation of, of these types of policies. I'll get to you in one sec. Um, what we also didn't look at is the cost on the natural gas distribution system. So when you have uh, an existing natural gas customer base, they have, there's a set of fixed costs that are spread amongst all those customers that are built into their rates, what they pay for their natural gas uh, and on their bills every month. As that natural gas customer, customer base erodes as a result of this policy, customers switching away from natural gas to electricity, you have fewer and fewer customers on that gas system paying for the same amount of fixed costs. So their rates go up, and therefore the remaining customers are saddled with higher costs associated with that electric, excuse me, with that natural gas distribution system. We did not account for that either. Those would be uh, significant as well. Please. Ah, oh, great. I'm glad I got, got, all right. We got ahead of that one. Uh, on the left side here, this is the kind of total cost. So I've showed you the, the per customer basis here, the per household. Uh, over here is just a breakdown of the total cost. I told you we ran two cases. I'm showing you the higher of the two. This is the renewables only case. So again, that is the generation case where all of the incremental electricity is met only with, uh, with renewables and battery storage. 
Um, and so we have consumer energy costs about $600 billion all, all in. Uh, consumer capital costs, so the energy costs, is the, that's the cost differential between your gas and electricity. Consumer capital costs, that's the appliance uh, purchase and installation. Power sector capital, this is all your new generation plants you're going to have to build, so in this case, wind and solar and store, uh, battery storage. Uh, transmission capital, we did a detailed transmission analysis in two areas of the country. I won't get into those details now, but those could be very significant. And I will say that to make that analysis work, uh, on the transmission analysis, that is, we had to make some pretty heroic assumptions about which projects would go forward. And any of you that have followed anything in the electric transmission, uh, interstate transmission market, knows how difficult it is to uh, site and build new electric transmission in this country. So even getting over all those hurdles, the costs, not insignificant. And then the total costs there. One point, what did I say? One point two trillion dollars. Please. So just rough numbers on that. Go back on the yeah. That's right. Um, this is our so the the uh, added capacity in this case we had increased peak power demand um, in our renewables only case going from. Uh, a little under 800 gigawatts, which is our working generation capacity, all the way up to about 1,200 gigawatts. Um, a significantly less generation build on our market-based generation case. Um, that's because natural gas is allowed in that case, and it runs at a higher capacity factor. And it is available on the coldest days of the year, where wind and solar uh, may not be operating. Uh, coincident with that peak electric heating demand uh, during your winter month. There's a lot going on here. I'll just, but that's the that's the short version of this of this chart. Uh, we asked ICF what would happen if you uh, electrified everything. So you went 100% residential electrification, our entire system running only on electricity, a residential sector running only on electricity. Uh, the short version of this chart is you would effectively double your peak electric consumption. And not only that, the entire U.S. electric grid would switch from a summer peaking system to a winter peaking system. So significant grid requirements associated with just residential end uses. Uh, power sector natural gas consumption increases in both cases as well. So uh, the, really what's happening is you're moving natural gas consumed in the residential sector and putting it over into the power generation sector and then taking that electricity and running your end uses with it. Uh, in, so compared to our reference case, again, this was the AEO 2017 case. In reference to that in 2035, um, CO2 emissions just from the power sector do go up in both cases. A uh, couple of interesting things are happening here. In the renewables only case, CO2 emissions go up more than our market-based generation case. There's two reasons for this. Um, one, in our market-based generation case, we didn't apply our electrification policy everywhere. Remember what I said earlier on that does policy-driven residential electrification actually make sense? And it depends where you are. And so in the places where it didn't make sense, we didn't apply it in the market generation case. Um, so therefore, you have less power demand as a result of this policy. In the renewables only case, it was going to make sense everywhere. So we applied the, uh, we applied the policy to every state. Um, and so that boosted emissions up relative to the market-based generation case in the power sector as a result of that increased uh, uh, power sector consumption. However, something else really interesting is going on that we did not expect from our modeling. And this is where models can provide you some really deep insights sometimes where you don't expect it. Uh, because we limited, uh, so the, re the renewable only case basically meant that no new natural gas could be built. Uh, the model, ICF's IPM was not, which is the model, their uh, integrated uh, power model, I think they call it. Um, it was not going to select any new coal. It was not going to select any new nuclear. Um, so it's going to select natural gas and wind and solar where it makes sense. If you limit natural gas, you only have wind and solar and batteries. 
what happens to the existing fossil fuel uh, generation uh, on the grid is that it runs longer than it did in the base case. And you actually defer retirements of some of that coal and natural gas because it has to stay on the grid in order to meet these new peak day demands associated with your electrified um, space and water heating. So basically what you do is when you, if you limit new natural gas on the system, you just keep older, less efficient natural gas on the system longer and therefore it boosts emissions even more than relative to what you would have had if you allowed new natural gas onto the system. We didn't expect this. It was kind of an interesting finding. It has some implications if someone ever says we should not build any new natural gas power fire generation. I would say all you're doing is just leaving the old stuff on there longer and you're just boosting emissions to what they would have already been. I've had some pushback on that idea, but we'll not go down that route. Uh, this pretty much says what I've told you already. What happens is that you've moved uh, change in consumer emissions. So this is uh, CO2 emissions in 2035 in the residential sector. Uh, those go down in both cases. Your change in power emissions, they go up in both, uh, in both cases. You're, but it, it's not the same amount. You're reducing emissions more in the residential sector than you are in the powered sector. And so you do get a net change in emissions. And these numbers, when you compare them to the 2035, it's about a 1 to 1.5% 1 reduction in uh, total greenhouse gas emissions in 2035. What are the costs? Again, if we take the costs of this electrification policy divided by the amount of uh, CO2 emissions reduction, ends up being about $600 to $800 per ton of CO2 reduced. Uh, a significant increase compared with other potential pathways to reduce emissions. And just kind of illustrative of what those costs might be, if you're looking at how New York prices its social cost of carbon, that's only in the 47 to $72 range, a whole order of magnitude less than the costs associated with the policy we're modeling here. Um, renewable natural gas, also, uh, this is, so renewable natural gas is a, a biogenically sourced uh, natural gas that has been upgraded to pipeline quality and could be injected into the system and it could help reduce emissions from residential space and water heat. Much lower cost per ton of CO2 reduced, at least according to these, uh, uh, these estimates. It depends where you are. I've just given you a bunch of national numbers, and they're meaningless. I think they're important for a national perspective and a national conversation, but if you're really going to do this analysis, you have to do it in your state, in your region, for your utility service territory. And you have to include all the other costs that I mentioned we didn't include in this analysis, your distribution system costs and your gas and electric, as well as some other costs we might think about uh, the result from this kind of policy approach. Uh, but even at this high level, we did do a regional analysis. This was the breakdown of that analysis. Uh, no surprise that the costs associated with these policies are going to be very significant in colder climates. Uh, the average customer in New York is going to be paying $33,000 more for their energy over the lifetime of their equipment. That is a prohibitive cost uh, when you think through um, the implications of these types of policies in that part of the country. Uh, costs much less significant in places in the West, Texas, and the South. Um, not wholly insignificant, uh, but I will say that you know here we're, we're looking at fairly modest increases in per year uh, energy consumption uh, as a result of this policy in Texas and the West. I will say though that while the kind of impact, the direct impact to customers might be small, these are still very costly approaches to emissions reductions. And that West number in particular, I know off the top of my head, is still $400 to $600 per ton of CO2 reduced. Part of that is you just don't have a lot of CO2 re to reduce. So that denominator is already pretty small, and so that drives up the cost per emissions reduction. Suffice to say, this is just one view of things, um, but in, it could still be a, a, a costly policy. Also, keep in mind that our, our costs are 
you know, what we assume from the annual energy outlook. And if you don't like the annual energy outlook, go find some different costs and plug it in. You might find some different results. We did this for Southern California. And, you know, keeping in mind that we kind of lumped the West together. And Southern California looks a lot, is going to be a lot different than, uh, than, than Washington uh, State. And if you plug in Southern California prices into this same model, <clears throat> Those, uh, this is the, the cost to the customer per year. Um, in our original modeling, it was only $40, pretty modest. Uh, that jacks up to about $560 per year. This, that's real money now when you're taking into account local costs and local considerations. So like I said, this, it's, this analysis, take it for what it's worth. But um, I guess my point is that those five questions that I asked, and we tried to answer with this study, you would have to do that again, but for your, uh, your locality, your state, your region, your service territory. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left. I do want to ask, uh, answer any questions. Let me just go through a couple more slides here, because I'm going to pivot. Uh, I, I work for the American Gas Association. We are an advocate for natural gas. But we are also citizens. I am a citizen. We exist uh, in Washington, D.C., where there is a conversation happening um, around climate change and around greenhouse gas emissions. We also come to places like Texas and elsewhere and talk with folks such as yourselves, state regulators, other uh, state and local policymakers. And they're having conversations around how we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so I've just given you a whole 45 minutes of why residential electrification might be an expensive or maybe not the greatest of policies. That's not enough, in my opinion. We need to think very carefully about how we are going to thoughtfully reduce greenhouse gas emissions and take into account customer impacts, cost to customers, overall costs of these policies. So when I say that there might be a more thoughtful pathway, uh, we did some work in parallel to this ICF AGA effort on electrification so that we could try to define, get our arms at least initially around this idea of what does a natural gas pathway to meaningful emissions reduction look like? Um, and might we achieve the same level of emissions reductions as I just showed you here, but at a significantly lower cost and at a significantly less impact to customers? Again, one of my charts, going back to the facts, where have we been in the residential sector, natural gas, uh, residential natural gas customers are the poster child for efficiency. On a per customer basis, a residential natural gas customer uses roughly half the amount of natural gas as they did in 1970. This is despite the fact that our homes have gotten bigger and all of these things. But, uh, efficiency of appliances, tighter building shells, the effect of uh, consumer conservation programs, uh, um, the positive effect of utility energy efficiency programming has helped drive uh, natural gas consumption on a per customer basis down for the past almost 50 years now, which means CO2 emissions from residential customers in the natural gas, uh, residential natural gas customers has dropped about by half since 1970. We are on a positive trend here, and this positive trend can continue. We worked with a, a consulting firm, uh, a number of technologists, really smart guys that know about end use technologies in homes and businesses, innovation partners. And we asked them, help us get our arms around what a natural gas pathway would look like to emissions reduction. So they evaluated 100 plus innovative natural gas technologies. These are technologies that are on the shelf now in the process of being commercialized or identified as promising but still require some research and development. We didn't do a cost analysis here. Stay tuned, we're working on some of that. But we just tried to get our arms around what, what, what can these technologies, these natural gas technologies, can, can, what can they contribute in terms of our shared goal of emissions reductions? And what they found is that on a per customer basis, an additional 25 to 40% reduction in CO2 emissions is achievable um, using advanced natural gas technologies. They also took it another step, and if you make some even 
I, let's not say wilder assumptions, but um, uh, adopt even more advanced technologies, micro combined heat and power, and integrated uh, the decarbonization of the gas supply, renewable natural gas, as I referred to earlier, uh, they found that a uh, 80 plus percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions could be achievable um, from, from residential natural gas and small commercial natural gas as well. Uh, just to give you a sense of what they looked at, I mean, they were looking at uh, absorption heat pumps for water heating, gas heat pump for space cooling and for space heating, um, building envelope improvements, Internet of Things based thermostats for the building efficiency, because that applies to need to make our buildings tighter and continually more efficient. Uh, they also looked at a, a range, uh, a range, a range of cooking uh, uh, applications as well as laundry as well. I mentioned advanced renewable natural gas. Let me spend just a second on this. Uh, I think there's a significant potential not only to increase the efficiency of our end uses and how we heat our space and heat our spaces, heat our water but also a potential to reduce the carbon footprint of our supply itself. And we're seeing a number of initiatives popping up all over the country related to renewable natural gas. Let me define that real quick. Renewable natural gas is uh, biogas sourced from uh, biogenic sources like waste, uh, wastewater treatment plants, uh, agricultural waste, uh, landfills, methane that would be coming off of landfills. Capture that gas, clean it up if needed, upgrade it to pipeline quality such that it meets your pipeline specifications and a pipeline tariff, inject it into the system and use it in these traditional end uses. Another way to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of our energy use. Uh, we are working on two follow-up studies to this work right now through uh, we, uh, I say the American Gas Foundation, uh, of which we, are, uh, we interact with. And right now we have uh, work underway to evaluate the resource potential for renewable natural gas in the United States. Doing a deep dive into a, uh, an analysis of the different feedstocks and the potential for not how much, looking at the potential in terms of how much renewable natural gas could be produced, what the cost associated with that might look like, as well as trying to quantify what the greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential of this supply resource uh, might be. So stay tuned. If I ever get a chance to come back and speak with you, I might have some more uh, details on this. It is underway as we speak. Um, with that, I just want to thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, but uh, I, I hope you got a little bit of perspective of how the gas industry sees a carbon fuel as part of a reliable, clean, and affordable, and lower carbon energy future. So I appreciate it. Thank you for your excellent presentation and being here. Hey, um, how economically viable is it for in the Northeast to replace the fuel oil that's used for heating with natural gas. So I would imagine that if they had natural gas lines down the roads, the distribution system, they would have just used that naturally? Or is that not true? Do they have, do some people have, have uh, fuel oil heating, but it just was economic in the past to use that versus natural gas? How, how realistic is it to put new distribution in to replace fuel oil in those regions where, um, there's an advantage. Uh, in some places, we are seeing that. We are seeing the distribution built out and expanded um, in places even in the Northeast. But you're right. There are challenges here, and there are economics associated with building out this infrastructure. And a natural gas system and laying natural gas pipe is an expensive proposition. And if you don't have a sufficient number of customers at the end of that line to justify the economics, you're not going to build it out. And so those fuel oil customers up in the Northeast, there might be opportunities to um, switch them to propane, for example, uh, which would reduce both emission um, criteria pollutants and CO2 emissions. 
Uh, but natural gas may not always be, a piped natural gas may not always be a solution. I have heard of some companies that are trying to think outside the box and use compressed natural gas to move uh, volumes of gas, compressed or even liquefied natural gas to move volumes that in other areas would have been moved by pipe, but truck it to new developments and then um, using some on-site storage serve natural gas to say a new development with that local distribution infrastructure there. Uh, not terribly widespread, but it has been thought through. It is, it is, it is happening in some cases. You bet. Thank you for your talk. I have a question. Have you also looked in your scenarios at using passive solar energy for some of the residential uses, for example, for water heating? Because then you will need either gas or electricity, and this could also reduce some of the emissions. And while it's true that using passive solar energy won't uh, allow you, for example, in the case of heating, right, you will still need to use either gas or electricity, but then you could still reduce more the emissions, as that graph that you were saying that now houses use uh, less em have less emissions. Uh, th so the you know, question, did we look at passive solar heating? Yes, we did. It was part of that Innovation Partners project. And it will be part of, I believe it would be part of this kind of advanced natural gas technology study I alluded to. If we can get that off the ground, if the Gas Foundation uh, gets it off the ground, then we would see that and start to think through um, some of the implications that you just suggested, as well as the costs associated with that. Um, was there another question in there that I missed? OK. So the answer is yes, we did, we did look at that. And it is part of the solution, right? These hybrid solutions, uh, gas electric hybrid solutions where you have a heat pump with a gas backup is really efficient. Because you use that heat pump most of the time is running at 300% efficiency. It's that coldest day of the year when that heat pump efficiency is going to drop and your electric demand is going to spike. That's when you know, electric resistance backup on a, on a typical heat pump system is going to jack up your, your, your energy demand and therefore your costs and all the infrastructure associated with meeting that peak demand. But if you have other types of backup, like say a natural gas backup, a natural gas furnace that's meeting that peak load, well, you can actually shave a lot of energy off of that front end with the heat pump and then use that gas to a lesser extent, but for that peak usage. And that system itself could be quite efficient. Um, you alluded to the solar, um, using that for water heat. Another example of how you use hybrid technologies, in this case, renewable solar to uh, heat your water, but with a gas backup so that customer demand and, uh, and, and their, uh, their needs will be met um, in a timely and necessary fashion, especially on a cloudy, cold day in the middle of winter. I, um I was recently reading about a development of a catalyst to convert methane into methanol. And um, what do you think about distributed um, conversion of, of underutilized gas at certain times of the year, converting it to a liquid fuel, storing it in distributed fashion, and then um, accessing it during, as, a, as a buffer for peak times? Uh. My honest answer is I haven't studied it too much, but I know some people that I respect a lot that have talked about methanol, especially in the vehicle transportation mar or the transportation vehicle market for quite a while. Uh, that includes our former Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz, who I've heard I think he's a, he's been a fan. I don't know if he still is, but I've heard him speak about methanol and its potential there. So my answer is I don't really know a good answer to that, but uh, sure. But makes sense to me. And if you can think about how to make that, met, where you get that methane from, if it can be a, a zero carbon or a carbon neutral source, then, you know, hey, another option in our toolbox here. You know, uh, methane, of course, is a greenhouse gas as well, much shorter lived, but more potent yeah. in terms of its effect. I'm just curious. Uh, to what extent uh, methane emissions, which have been a concern um, for LDCs as well as interstate pipelines, to what extent these studies incorporated changes in methane emissions, and then related to that, what AGA might be doing in effect to try and support uh, reductions in methane emissions by its members? 
We, uh, we addressed methane in, the, in our report. I don't have a slide for it, and I have to be quite honest, I can't remember the exact numbers, and I don't want to quote them to you. The, the overall impact of methane, when you include uh, methane into this analysis, it's, it's fairly minimal. The, the CO2 emissions are dominant in, in the analysis. Uh, but it, but it, has a, it has an impact, and it's, and it's worth including if you're, again, being very thorough about this type of analysis. Um, if you were to look at methane impacts, though, you, like truly in this, in this kind of analysis, uh, you'd have to be very careful because if you're using more gas, if you're, if you're lowering gas demand, that's going to have effects on production of natural gas and the movement of gas, and the relative impacts of methane from those different sectors aren't going to be totally uh, uh, proportional to simply, uh, it won't be necessarily pr proportional to the amount of natural gas consumed on the system. It, it's not linear there. So you'd have to treat it very carefully. Um, that's my way of s s wiggling out of your, uh, a good answer for you. But, um, but we did consider it as part of this analysis. Uh, and in terms of the, the methane trends on the ga gas distribution system, uh, just one data point, uh, natural gas distribution systems have lowered their methane emissions 73% since 1990. This is a result of replacing pipeline. Um, upgrading meter and regulator stations and so forth. The distribution system is getting tighter all of the time. And so, that, and so just from the, the end of the system, again, what our members own and operate and what we represent, that system has been, been getting tighter over time and methane emissions have been decreasing. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, based on your study, uh, what is the uh, the uh, future conclusion or maybe the s suggestion for the natural gas? Are you going to think about uh, phase out the natural gas eventually or uh, like the ultimate renewable energy in the long run in the future? Or just uh, maybe phase out the natural gas uh, uh, instead of a 2023 policy? Right. Or uh, you want to get the extreme use of the natural gas uh, in the future? Do we have another hour? Uh, this is something I'm thinking about very deeply right now. Um, and, it, and it's a great question, because these types of questions are being asked by policymakers, by other environmental advocates and others. Um, and there's a lot of thinking around that. Do we, you know, is the gas system is, we're delivering a carbon-based fuel predominantly through it. Do we need to get rid of the gas system in order to achieve our carbon objectives, whatever, however you might define that? Um, I kind of like to think about things simply here, and in my mind, we have 2.5 million miles of natural gas pipeline in this country, uh, the most extensive infrastructure base in terms of pipeline uh, capacity and storage, um, the envy of the world. Does it really make sense as a matter of climate policy to rip that all out of the ground and toss it on the side of the road and build up a completely separate and different system in its place? Uh, that just... I'm intuitively doesn't totally make sense to me. So maybe there are ways we can leverage the system um, more thoughtfully uh, and to achieve our carbon emission reduction objectives. But I think that's going to require some new thinking, some around how these how these systems might be owned and operated. And I, I don't have any policy prescriptions here, but simply put, these these are pipelines. And as I just said, you can, move non, you can move zero carbon fuels through these pipelines. You can move hydrogen through these pipelines up to some certain blending amount. Um, is there a way we can think a little bit more creatively about how we leverage this infrastructure instead of just saying, oh, that, we're done with it, managed wind down, let's, let's move on here. Uh, so that's my short version of a two-hour presentation. Thank you. I think there's one more. Oh, a couple more. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. I know that you've mentioned natural gas is better during cold weather events in winter, but I also know that Texas has experienced capacity shortages during cold weather events as a result of believe of wellheads freezing over. 
Have there been significant improvements on that since, or? Uh, it's a great question, and every winter we do tend to see at least some place in the country a freeze-off event that has that that impacts natural gas production flows. Uh, we saw this come to a quite literally a head, and, a, and it became a problem in Texas. I think this was during the 2014 polar vortex. I can't speak to what Texas has done, and so I, I won't try, but. Um, the, I, the that is in the space of what I believe to be a topic of reliability and resilience of our gas system and really more broadly our whole energy system. Uh, it, I don't know how to answer that sh in a short way, but um, yeah, a lot of steps are being taken and analysis is being done uh, to understand where are the vulnerabilities of the gas system. What happens if you have a single point of failure somewhere and are there redundancies so that we can continue to, you know, so that our system does not fail in the event of one of these events? Um, say that, generally speaking, the gas system is very reliable. The distribution system itself, I, the recent analysis from the Gas Technology Institute you know, designated it uh, sig six Sigma reliability, which I didn't know that term, but I guess that's an important term when you're looking through, looking at reliability uh, in other non-energy sectors. So uh, suffice to say it is, I, I don't have a great answer for like what's being done here, but uh, the gas system is quite reliable, uh, but there are always room for improvement. Happy to follow up with you more if you'd like. I'll make this the last question. Thanks. Just one simple question. If you were able to reduce uh, energy production from coal and fuel oil, uh, would natural gas be an, an acceptable bridge, you know, for generation of electricity and therefore uh, be a clean future? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm happy to probe that question with you some more. I, I'm not quite sure how to say how to dive into that, but, but I think so. I think it already is, right? We're already seeing less coal on the grid and more natural gas, if, I, if I'm understanding your question. Okay. So, yeah. Of oil and gas? Oh. Well, I don't know how to answer that. Oil's pretty valuable still, so... Um, on the production side, uh, yeah, if, we're, if, the, if the demand is there, I think the resource potential is. Um, but that's not just dependent on what's happening with gas and gas use and power generation. That's completely a function of our liquids consumption, what's happening in transportation, petrochemical use, and so forth. So I don't know a short way to answer that other than to say it's complicated. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>